Good evening, everyone. God bless you. Well, I'd like to start uh, the evening off by sharing uh, a shout out that I wanted to say for tonight's message. I didn't do it this morning during our live devotional video because I wanted to save it uh, for this evening, but I just want to send out a very uh, loving and joy-filled happy birthday to my awesome grandson, Levi. Praise God. I put out a post for you today, buddy. I don't know if you saw it yet, but you got lots of people everywhere, all around the world and all across the country that love you and wish you a happy birthday today. And because I'm not able to see you today, I wanted to tell you happy birthday face to face. So praise God. I know you're watching. So happy birthday, Levi, and love you very much. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Precious church family, Sister Wanda and I send you greetings and uh, always thankful to be together. I have entitled tonight's message, My Peace. My peace, and there are some thoughts here tonight that the Spirit of God has for us that I know will encourage you and, uh, and bless you and bring the peace that Jesus, our Savior, is talking about, or at least enhance that precious peace that passes all understanding that I know many of you uh, already have. So praise God. Let's get right to it. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14. We'll begin at John chapter 14, concerning the Lord talking about his peace, which he said, my peace. Praise the Lord. Let's take a look at it. John chapter 14, one verse right now, verse 27. Jesus speaking, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a group of words flowing from the heart of our dear Savior Jesus. Now, these words are spoken by Jesus to his own disciples who were at this particular time very troubled in their own hearts. I want you to capture that. Of course, these words come to us today as well through the word, but he was speaking in this particular text to his own disciples and capture that they were in a particular time of anxiety and trouble, very, very troubled in their own hearts. And they were troubled because he had just made it very clear to them that he was about to leave them to die, to be taken from them, and that, he, and that they would no longer be able to enjoy his physical presence with them. So everything that Jesus is saying to them is based upon this particular setting. They were in a crisis. Things seem to be collapsing all around them. They're beginning to lose their bearings and didn't quite know where they were or what they could do. Disorientation, trouble, anxiety, crisis. Jesus speaks these words to them in the midst of that. And, and it was in this particular setting that God made this powerful statement. He says, peace. I leave with you my peace, the very peace which I guide myself, Jesus is saying, of which I am the author, I give to you. Now, we're obviously taking a look at this because of the circumstances we find ourselves in in this life and in this world again. In light of national events as well as global events, combined, of course, with many other morbid and crippling headlines and realities that are taking place. Now, we know that the Bible itself explains quite clearly why these particular situations take place and continue to take place. Why is it that in the world that is so educated or so advanced, 
that there should still be these problems and unanswered questions to so many that characterize the life of humanity throughout the centuries. We have found that the Bible gives us perfectly, gives us a perfectly clear and simple explanation for all of it. But here in our text, we hear the Lord speaking in a more personal way. His disciples, his disciples are dealing with a crisis. And here we can see in a more, in a more personal sense, while asking the question, what does the word of God say to me? What does the gospel have to offer me in this situation? What does it offer to do for me? Now, in looking at this, we're going to be face to face with what the gospel in essence basically says to all of us, what it claims to do and what it offers to do for anybody who believes it and receives it. And remember, what he is offering his disciples here was absolutely and completely, ultimately fulfilled in the lives and experiences of these very disciples that he's speaking to. I mean, we can see that in the book of Acts. Just take a look at the life of the apostle Peter, who initially was very fearful, very unsettled about a lot of things and all of this. Every time the Lord even mentioned his death, Peter would say things like, far be it from thee, Lord. You see, Peter couldn't get his mind around this thing. And again, how about at the time Jesus was arrested and put on trial? Peter was outside in the courtyard of Caiaphas. The trial was taking place. And a maid girl began to say to him that he was one of the Lord's men, that he was with him, that he was a friend of this prisoner. And Peter was so terrified by this that he denied his Lord and said that he did not even know him and had nothing to do with him. And then he even did it with cursing. But turn to the book of Acts and you find that this very Peter, who was so previously unsettled, and in some ways cowardly, in all of his former and sometimes boastfulness, this same Peter, who at times could talk big, but didn't do very well in a crisis or a test, that same Peter later on became a fulfillment of this promise given here by our Lord. Now, Peter can speak, glory to God, with a holy boldness. He can defy the authorities that oppose the gospel and his Savior. He's not afraid of anybody. Why? Because he has received this gift of peace. And this peace has enabled him to become strong and focused by the Holy Spirit a powerful man of God in all of his circumstances and in every situation. He becomes a, a verification and fulfillment of the very thing that our Lord offers to all of us. And so here we see in our text one of the central claims of our Christian faith. Jesus claims to give us peace. Even in this world that we live in, this is one of its most powerful and fundamental offers. The gospel promises that if we just simply receive it, take it, and live by it, we can know peace in the midst of the storm. Peace in the midst of trials and tribulation. So let's look at it this way. The test of any kind of teaching or philosophy or, or any view of life is simply this. What is it like in a crisis? That's the true test of any point of view or teaching. What is it like in a crisis? Now, everybody has some view of life. Everybody has 
some sort of personal perspective. Uh, they say, that's my view. That's how I see things. And they're living according to their view. Now, the truest test of any view is how does it stand up to a crisis? How does it stand up to a test? Any kind of view or, or teaching can say a great deal about itself when there isn't much of a problem or difficulty. You know, when the skies are all nice and blue and, and, and everything is going well. During these times, almost any teaching, every teaching and view of life can say a great deal about itself. But fair skies and smooth waters are not the real test, is it? Any view that claims to deal with the reality of life all of life, its test is, real, is, is rarely seen when something happens, when suddenly you're surrounded by difficulty and problems. Suddenly something appears that tests you to the very core. Does your teaching or point of view hold you then? Does it hold you then? Does it hold up? Does it help you then? Does it hold true and productive in such a situation, let's bring it even closer. Is your view of life standing the test of the present circumstances? In other words, are you enjoying peace? In your heart and in your mind, in the midst of trouble, are you in trouble? Can you honestly say that you are at ease? Is this point of view that you have and that you've always defended and lived by, is it showing itself successful and victorious in this present testing? Here's another question. Is it possible that sometimes perhaps some of us can delude ourselves into thinking that we actually are a Christian? Because... In a time like this, a time of crisis, a time of testing, is also an excellent test of our profession of the Christian faith. You see, there are many people who say, well, of course I'm a Christian. You see, I was baptized as a baby. I was raised in a Christian household. I was placed in a Christian school. Of course I'm a Christian. And yet you find so many times that when these folks are up against some sort of test or crisis, they don't seem to know where they are at all. They're disoriented, completely off balance. And what they thought was their faith doesn't seem to be helping them in any way, shape, or form. Their attitude is no different than any of those that are out in the world. But you'll notice here that our Lord draws a great distinction between those who are Christians and those who are in the world. He says, I'm not going to manifest myself to the world, but I am to the believer. The Christian will have the Holy Spirit in him, which is where this peace comes from. You see, the world won't. Because the world won't believe him. They can't receive him because it doesn't see him. When Jesus said he was going to send uh, 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 the helper, that he might abide with them forever, he said in verse 17, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. You see, Jesus draws a great distinction here between those who are believers and those who are in the world. He says, I'm not going to manifest myself to the world, but I am to the believer because the Christian will have the Holy Spirit in him. The world won't because the world won't believe him. They can't believe him because they can't receive him because it doesn't see him unless they're willing to open and receive and believe they won't there are people who have always regarded themselves as christians yet 
What about in times of sickness or crisis or while facing death? There are people who have uh, even loved ones facing death. I'm very privileged to be a pastor of a church where uh, I'm just on the phone this very week to people who are knocking on the door of this possibility. And their faith is so alive and so profound. And even through tears, there's joy and hope, even laughter, praise God. You see, that's quite different from the many people that have always regarded themselves as Christians. Yet what about those times in sickness or crisis or while facing death or while a loved one is facing death? They don't seem to be helped by their Christianity at all. They are exactly as if they were not saved at all. Let me ask you another question tonight. Is your faith holding you this moment? Your faith. Is it holding you this moment? Are you able to rest upon it? Are you enjoying this peace that the Lord is speaking about here? Now, that is the main question because our Lord himself pointed out that terrible possibility that exists in the parable of the sower. He said, there's a farmer who goes scattering seed and some falls by the wayside. Immediately the birds come and pluck it up and that's the end of that seed. There's another seed that falls upon some sort of hard ground, some stony ground. It, it does get some sort of root and it springs up quickly. But he said that when persecution and trials and tribulation comes, it ceases. There appeared to be life, but there wasn't life at all. Then he said there's another seed that falls amongst the thorns. Jesus again said it appears to, it, it appears to put up a good show, but it is soon strangled by thorns. What are these thorns? the cares of this life, this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. They choke the word. You see, at a time like this, and in light of the gospel, we are forced to have to examine ourselves, to test ourselves. If what you call your Christian faith isn't making all the difference in the world to you, then you better go back and examine the foundations again. You better test and see if ye be in the faith and determine whether it is the Christian faith at all. Because this is what the Christian faith offers. This is what the Christian faith gives. Jesus says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Now, let's take a look at this a little further. We see that our Lord is here putting his finger upon what is in many ways the central problem of life in this world and, and all around us. And what is that? Well, it is the problem of anxiety and the problem of fear. The problem of anxiety and the problem of fear. Jesus said to them, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And by that word afraid, he really means being afraid. Jesus didn't use that word lightly or half-heartedly or indifferently. He means being alarmed and terrified, shaking and, and reeling because you don't know where you are or what to do. And this is among the greatest problems in this present hour. You don't have to be a Christian to recognize that the greatest problem confronting society today is the problem of anxiety, inner turmoil, confusion, and fear. Everywhere you go and everything you hear is speaking to this very issue. From the headlines to the talking heads to the current debates, you can see that there's a great lack of sense of any dimension of security or stability. They're surrounded by confusion. That there is a great lack of rest and peace in the lives of people living in this world today. 
They're surrounded by confusion and fear. And there is so much of this in, manifested in so many ways. There's the fear of life itself. More and more people are beginning to feel that life itself is a burden and a problem, that it is perplexing. And they're afraid of life. Some in such despair taking their own life. And then there is another kind of fear in this world. It's the fear of the future. There was a time when the world seemed stable, but things like world wars and nuclear weaponry and 9-11 and of course recent and current events have all but eradicated that feeling. Everyone, both inside and outside of the Christian faith know that there are some kind of brutal and irrational forces that are manipulating events and seeking to hurl us into some sort of disaster. These things behind the scenes concerning the mystery of iniquity and, and many other things that I don't have time to go into tonight, but we'll be touching on soon. In the realm of violence... Man has never been so inhuman and monstrous toward one another as they've been in the last hundred years, even the last hundred months. Many of the things that we have seen and heard would have been unthinkable just a short time ago. Powers that are coming out of darkness itself. No respect for law and order. It means nothing. People simply governed by their own desires, lust, passions. And the more you see it, the more brutal and demonic and irrational you see that it is. This is the kind of thing that is leading to this modern sense of insecurity, confusion, and disorientation. And the result is that people feel they no longer have any kind of stability, no anchor. The whole future seems uncertain. Order is being tossed out the window, and there is no place of peace, no place of rest. That is the place and the problems that most people, saved or unsaved, are in agreement about. That these things are, in fact, happening all around us. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And by that, I, I specifically say, Christian believers, but everybody. What are you going to do about it? Now, this being the problem, it is a problem, hear, hear this, it is a problem in which the world itself cannot deal with. The world itself cannot deal with this problem. Jesus says, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Then he says, not as the world gives do I give unto you. This problem of fear, perplexity, despair, anxiety, disorientation, confusion, instability. It is a problem in which the world itself cannot deal with. Thank God, Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Thank God. You see, he knows, as we know, that the world is always offering its own form or type or offer of peace. And that is why the world doesn't turn to Christ. That's the problem. That's why the world is not turning back to God. They're not looking in the direction of Jesus Christ, who is called the Prince of Peace. Why not? Because they believe they can discover peace in their own ways. In this world, Jesus says it's impossible but the world is still claiming it and people are still looking for it. Well, just take a look at some of the world's methods. Let, let's take a look at it. Some try to obtain peace by refusing to face the facts. They shut their blinds. They shut off the headlines. They shut everything out. And they call that peace. By ignoring the bad news, they call that peace. Thank God that's not the Lord's method. Jesus is realistic. He faces the facts. He gives us a faith 
that faces the facts. And this is why he says, not as the world gives, give I unto you, says the Lord. Uh, another method of the world is a complete willingness to look at everything taking place, but then turning to some sort of <clears throat> entertainment or pleasure or recreation, something that just takes their mind off of it for a while, something that will carefully ease it out of their memory. That, that, that's their way, the world's way of trying to persuade themselves that they have found peace. They try to fill themselves with these things, filling their minds and entire outlook with it. Because the mind has the ability. It has that ability. You can push one thing out by filling it with another. And all those who hustle the products of entertainment and pleasure know that all perfectly too well. The world can't deal with this. Jesus said that. He said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give unto you. Thank God. Another method of the world is wishful thinking. And that just means that people say to themselves, well, of course the news is bad, but everything's going to be all right, man. Everything's going to be cool. Everything will turn out okay. There's no doomsday, no judgment day. There's no God dealing with us in any way, and even Christians say God's not dealing with us in any way. Just see the world through rose-colored glasses. Wishful thinking. Look back in Bible history and see the multitude of people gathered around the false prophets who said to Israel, there's not going to be any judgment. They said, peace, peace, but there was no peace what the word said. False prophets declaring peace, peace. But God said, but there was no peace. The world. Another method of the world is the attempt to find peace by resorting to drugs, by means of drugs or, or drinking or other cravings of the flesh. Why? Again, because they haven't got peace. They're trying desperately to get it, but they don't have it. Because you see, none of these things give peace. And it is for this obvious and simple reason that not a single one of them gets you to face the problem. That's the reason why none of them bring peace. None of these methods brings peace. And it is for the obvious and simple reason that not a single one of them gets you to face the problem. Not one of them. Why? Because they are all methods of escape. In one way or another, they're all trying to get you to treat your reaction to the problem. To treat how you feel about the problem. What the problem put you through. Or is putting you through. Instead of bringing you yourself face to face with the problem. They don't really face the problem. They are all the all of these methods found in the world, offered by the world, and sought after by the world, they are all simply a feeble attempt to medicate the symptoms of this terrible thing that grips the hearts and minds of mankind. And all they are facing in this hour of history. And all of this, our Lord's words are surely justified. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. And thank God it isn't. Listen, I didn't come online here tonight to say, cheer up, everything's all right. I didn't come online to put a bright and cheerful, happy message so at least while you're listening, you don't have to think about the problem. That's not the gospel. That's psychology. That's the world's method, and tragically much of today's ministry's method. But that is not the Lord Jesus Christ's method. What was his method? Well, here is his method. He gives us this peace, first of all, by exposing us to the true cause of our unrest. You know, there's no book in the world that is as realistic 
as the word of God. No book in the whole world as realistic as the word of God. People say it's a fairy tale, a myth. An old saying that it's the dope of the masses. But this is the only honest and realistic book in the entire world today. It exposes the entire cause of our lack of ease, our unrest, the anxiety of the hearts and minds of men, the lack of stability. It exposes the entire cause of our lack of ease. It speaks of people becoming victims of circumstances instead of living with this peace about which our Lord speaks. It, the, it causes us, it prompts us, it compels us to look at the facts straight in the face. And the word of God exposes and reveals the root cause of all of this unrest, both in the world as well as the church, which I will be speaking much about this Sunday morning. This Sunday morning, I have to bring a message that has originated in the very heart of God from his throne that will probably be one of the most difficult messages I have ever had to bring since he has called me and somehow saw fit to entrust me with this gospel, with this word, this Sunday morning. But let me continue. But here we see Jesus saying, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. How does he do it? Well, he does it first and foremost by convicting us by his Holy Spirit of the truth of all that he has revealed to us in his word. He convicts us by his Spirit, revealing to us that everything he has said is true. Everything he has revealed in his word is true. And he gives us the picture of ourselves. And the Spirit convicts us that it's true. And we say by that Spirit, we say by that sweet conviction, that is me. There I am. I see it now. You see, it's a work wrought by the Spirit of God. And the person says, that is me. There I am. I see it now. And then Jesus says, well, all right then. And as long as you're like that, you will never know peace. As long as you remain in that condition, you will never know peace because your whole view of yourself is wrong and your whole view of God is wrong. But I have sent my word to reveal this to you. And the person says, I see it. There I am. I see it now. But we also have to see this. We have to see that we were never meant to live like this. The Bible reveals this to us. That we were never meant to live like this. That we were meant to live for God and under God's blessing. That we were made for God. That we were meant for God. And we see through the word of God, that in a relationship with God, we can live like that. Made for God, meant for God, living for God, under God's blessing. We see that in a relationship with God, we can live like that. And here's the Son of God speaking. He was in this world. He walked upon this earth, a world full of sin, violence, horror. The world that you and I are in. He lived in this world. He was in this world. He walked upon this earth. The world that you and I are in. With all the troubles and all the problems. Yet, he went through it all in perfect peace. And he says, I can empower you to do the same thing. I'll give you my peace, Jesus says the peace that I know myself. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to all of us. I'll give you my peace, the peace I know myself in spite of all that men do to me. And here he is in our text speaking about his own death, 
the cruel death of the cross. And he says in the midst of all of that, my peace I give to you. The disciples are in a state of intense unrest and anxiety. They're worried about him. They're worried about themselves. But he says, listen, I'm the one that's going to die. I'm the one going to that cross. And I'll give you my peace. Hallelujah. How does he do it? He does it, of course, by introducing us to God. God was in Christ reconciling men back to himself. You see, Jesus does this for us by his spirit. The moment you see yourself as you really are and the true cause of your own anxiety, you see at once that you have sinned against God. So you say, how can I find God? How can I know God? If God can give me peace, how do I find this peace? Where is this peace? I know I need forgiveness. How can I be forgiven? And here Jesus comes in with his answer. He says, my peace, the peace which I'm going to purchase for you through the shedding of my own blood. I'm going to the cross. Let not your, let not your hearts be troubled because I'm going there. I'm going to have, I'm go, my blood will be shed. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again from the dead. The, let not your hearts be troubled because I'm going there. Why? Because you'll never know peace unless I go there. Let not your hearts be troubled. How is it? Where is it? Where do we find it? Jesus says, the peace that I'm going to purchase for you is going to be wrought by the work I'm doing on that cross. I'm going to the cross. Let not your hearts be troubled. And I'm going to rise again. That's right. I'm going there. And we always still say, even in the world today, why? Jesus looks at us all and says, because you'll never know peace unless I go. That's what he was telling his disciples. You'll never know peace unless I go. And he's telling them on the way to it, my peace I give to you. I'm going to bear your sins. I'm going to take your punishment upon myself. I'm going to reconcile you to God and make you his children. And then he will strengthen you and set your feet steadfast and secure on an unmovable rock. And then pour his blessings out upon you. Hallelujah. But it isn't merely a question of forgiveness, you know. He then gives us his own nature. He gives us his own life. He gives us himself. That is an essential part of the teaching of the gospel. You can have a new mind, a new outlook. In fact, and in truth, you become a new man, a new creation. You're in the same world, but you are a new man. And because you are a new man, you see everything else in a different way. You've got an entirely new view of yourself, an entirely new view of life in this world. You've got a new view of how life is to be lived. No longer running away from things, but looking straight at them with the strength that Jesus Christ supplies. Empowered by the Spirit of God to live a life of holiness as he lived, being right with God and going on from now on, day by day, with God in this peace. And yes, even able to look into the face of death, like one of our precious faith-filled, joy-filled brothers is dealing with in our own ministry right now, filled with faith, filled with hope, filled with joy, and still filled with questions. Talked with him the other day, another question. Still filled with life while facing death. Yes, that's what this gospel offers, even able to look into the face of death right straight in the eye. Because when you're a Christian, you look into the face of death and you see through it. You see beyond it. You see that death is nothing but the door that opens the way of entry into the eternal joy and presence and blessing of Almighty God. 
You see that it is the door into everlasting life filled with peace and joy that is beyond our present ability to comprehend or define. And that was how our Lord was able to do it. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He looked through it. He looked beyond it. He saw you and I and everyone else in human history who has ever placed their faith in him. He saw us there with him. He saw all of us in the presence of God. And he says, I'll give you my peace. As Christians, we enjoy this peace because through his word, we have come to know that this is only a passing world and that it doesn't terrify us. Death doesn't terrify us. Whatever the world may do, it cannot touch the true place to which I now belong, the place that God has prepared for those who love him. Listen to how Jesus says it in chapter, in this same chapter, the first three verses. Let not your heart be troubled. He says it, he had started with this and he says it again. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. No wonder God has said that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. No wonder God said that. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. How? Foolish it is to believe that this is the only world and to fear sickness, disease, war, and death. Because listen, no matter how it happens, we are all going out of this life. But if you realize that beyond it, there remains for you one of these rooms one of these mansions which Jesus himself has built and prepared for you, then you will come up to the standard of the first believers who, even when being thrown to the lions at the amazement of everybody, they were singing praises to the Most High God, thanking God that they were suffering for his namesake. And they knew it was the day of their crowning. They called it the crowning day, the crowning day, the crown of glory. The wreath of glory was placed upon their brow. What does Jesus say to us? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Let not your heart therefore be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Do you have this peace tonight? The truth is, you either do or you don't. You're either terrified of life as it is today, or you can look at it with a steady heart and a steady hand and say, yes, I don't need to look the other way. I don't need to run in the other direction or somehow try to persuade myself that everything is going to be well with the strength that the Son of God has given me and with the continued strength that the Son of God supplies, I will go on living this life and serve the Lord day by day, knowing that nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this is why we say, yea, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. If you don't have this peace, then run to Christ right now. Go to him. Confess to him. Accept his diagnosis and his cure. Confess your sins and ask him to receive you and to cleanse you. 
Ask him to cleanse you with his blood from all your sins and give to you a new life. And my friends, he will receive you. Yes, he will. He said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. Run to him now and hear him say to you, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Glory to God and hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for tuning in. We send our love to everyone, all of our church members with all of our hearts, all of our friends and loved ones everywhere. May God bless you and we'll see you, Lord willing, tomorrow morning for our devotional at 9 a.m. as we continue to look at the prayers of Jesus. Love one another, call one another, text and email one another, continue to be a blessing to one another. This is the constant work of our ministry and on and on and on it goes day by day. Why? Because of his peace which surpasses all understanding. Hallelujah. God bless you. Good night.